going to continue with our studies in the book of John. So if you return to chapter 6, we'll look at verses 67 through 69 here in just a moment. Earlier in the chapter when Jesus taught that he was the bread of life, it upset and troubled quite a few people. In his use of figurative language, many formed the false idea that he actually was speaking of cannibalism. If you look at John 6, 51 through 59, that'll become clear. They simply misunderstood him. Some were actually offended. They lacked faith in him. Verses 60 through 65. But we learned that even some, in fact, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Verse 66. I don't know how many, many is, much more than a few. There are always things that will disappoint us in doing the Lord's will trying to spread the gospel, trying to teach others, trying to even work with brethren can be disappointing. You know, if these people who were offended at what he said had just thought to say, well, now, let's go back over that. I wonder what he really meant by that. But they didn't. Or maybe we need to think a little more about this before we do what we're doing. But they didn't. But that should be a lesson to us. I remember in the open forum a long time ago at Freed Hardeman, there'd be people stand up in the audience of several thousand folks, and <laughs> every once in a while somebody would stand up and say to Brother Woods, who conducted it for so many years, did I understand you to say? <laughs> Brother Woods would say, how do I know what you understood me to say? And that's what it amounts to a lot of times is I understood something, but how can the fellow who taught me know what I understood him to say if I don't express myself? One time in a class in college, one of the students raised his hand to Brother Bales and said, would you mind uh, going back through that again? And put it together in a nutshell. And Brother Bales, whose glasses are always about like this, uh, gave him that professorial look and uh, went back over it. And when he finished, he said, if you got it, it's in a nutshell. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, we need to take heed what we hear. <laughs> and we need to take heed how we hear it. And we need to be willing to ask questions if we don't understand. Before, like many college students have done, they drop the class. <laughs> Patience and willingness to pursue, to inquire, and don't feel like you're being a dummy because you asked a question that Jake well probably all the rest of them already got this and I just don't. Now, that's just not the way it ought to be. So we have a chance even in how we deal with sayings that seem to be hard at first to show the Lord we really believe he's the Lord and though we didn't understand what he taught here we shall pursue it more because he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's not going to teach us anything that's not for our spiritual good. And that's a very important point that comes out of this. Now, because of the departure of these disciples, Jesus turned then and asked the twelve, Will ye also go away? Verse 67. And it's Peter again that uh, speaks up. He responds to the Lord's question. And really, that serves as our sermon text. 
Look at verse, beginning at verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe the American Standard 1901 has in verse 69, We know, we know. You can't know without credible witnesses and adequate evidence. And they had that. Your belief, your faith can't be right if your knowledge is wrong. Since faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, and the Word conveys knowledge. Then if our faith is to be right, we've got to know accurately what the Word of God teaches. Now the apostles... At least Peter did, and I'm sure it's true of the others. I think he's speaking for them. Confess that Jesus alone has the words of eternal life. Latter part of verse 68. Thou hast the words of eternal life. Now a word is a vehicle of thought. It is a sign of an idea. And without the words of Christ, we don't know about life eternal. We don't know anything about it as we ought to. He also declared, that is Peter, their faith in him as the Christ, the Son of the living God, John 6, verse 69. So they know the truth. And their faith is based on the truth. Now the question I ask myself is, uh, is my faith based upon the truth? Is my faith based upon accurate knowledge? Is my faith based upon a complete knowledge of a given topic pertaining to spiritual matters? So to whom shall we go to find the purpose of life? We used to say where I came from, what I'm here for, and where I'm going. To find out about eternal life. Well, there are many places and many people to which we can go. And I'm afraid most of the world do go there. But they go to the wrong ones. They don't go to the right ones. For example, we could go, and, and many do, to the opinions of the majority. Concerning the truth about God, the majority has rarely been right. If you think about it, rarely. And then some will go to, well, don't want to go against my family. What does my family think about this? Or what do my peers think about it? Nowadays, it may be what the ladies' polls have to say about something. Some people will say, well, I... I got all my education at my college or university, and I want to know what the alma mater, my alma mater, thinks about it. Maybe some of you will say, well, what does my political party think about that? And all sorts of places people go. Well, none of those I just mentioned are the place we ought to go. The apostles understood that. I don't know that they fully understood what Jesus was meaning when he said, I'm the bread of life. When you partake of me, you'll never hunger again. But I think they knew that Jesus had their spiritual well-being always at heart and that they'd just stick around and find out a little more about it. I wonder how many of us would have ever been like Peter who was always opening his mouth ahead of others. And he got him in trouble sometimes. Remember when the Lord was telling him about, well, I've got to go up to Jerusalem and there I'll be put to death. Well, Peter had, a, had misinformation about the nature of the kingdom, as did the other apostles and the Jews of his day. And he began to rebuke the Lord and said, no, you're, don't, you're not going up there to die. And what did the Lord say to him? 
Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou savest not the things of God, but of men. In other words, you have a viewpoint that pertains to the way men see things, but I'm not looking at it that way. And we'll see things a lot differently from what all of the men see them if we'll know the truth and evaluate everything else in the light of the truth. Jesus had taught in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, the people to enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Well, you might pause here and say, well, why is that the case, Lord? Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life. That's what we're talking about, eternal life. And few there be that find it. In your old King James Version, you have straight spelled S-T-R-A-I-T and not S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T. That second straight is like a straight line, but S-T-R-A-I-T means a narrow, hemmed-in passage that you can't just accidentally or nonchalantly shuffle down. And in the case of the way to heaven, it's a narrow, hemmed-in passage by the will of God, by the commandments of God. And if you're all caught up in loving the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, and all the various ways that a human being can gratify those things, they, they make you too big, if you please, to enter in that narrow, hemmed-in passage, which is the way to eternal life. So few there are that are going to divest themselves of the affairs of this world to find Jesus, to learn the way to heaven. That's why that the way to heaven is straight, S-T-R-A-I-T, straight. It's a narrow way. And people love broadways. Following the majority. Well, what if we had done that? We're looking through, we could pick up a lot of things here, but we'll take something very simple to us. If we had followed the majority in Noah's day, we'd all drown in the flood. If we had followed the majority in Lot's day when Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain were destroyed by God, we would have been destroyed right along with them. And even Lot lost his wife because she didn't have enough faith to not look back. And she did. She turned to a pillar of salt. And in Joshua's day, as far as the Jews are concerned, Everybody, 20 years old and upward except Joshua and Caleb, perished in the wilderness wandering. And the Jews wandering in the wilderness is a type of the church in the world today. They had to prove that they would be loyal to God in keeping the commandments of the Lord and acting faithfully if they would enter the land of Canaan. And so it is with us today. We've got one time to prove to God He means more to us than anything else on this earth. And even our own life also. Then there are those that not just turn to the majority or family or whatever. They turn to human philosophers. To human wisdom. I doubt it's that apparent unless you are one of the few that will study the various philosophers that have had an impact upon the Western world, and even the Eastern world for that matter. But you would be surprised when you study them of how many of them laid the foundation for all kinds of doctrines. G.F.W. Hegel was a German philosopher. And without going into a lot of his doctrine, his philosophy, he influenced greatly the communist Marxism, Leninism, communism. He influenced tremendously the modern philosophies in education. Some of you may have never heard of Thomas Dewey. 
but he influenced so many people in the modern day educational institutions. We see how they operated basically because of Dewey and yet Hegelian philosophy got in Dewey. And some of these names some of us never know. And yet we meet up with them every day through their influencing people down through time. I think of people going to their alma maters or to some higher education school to learn what they ought to learn. Well, I've been enough to those to find out some of those people when you begin to ask them questions really don't want to answer them because they don't like to be put on the spot. And they just don't have the answers. So people turn to professors. Or they turn to uh, psychologists or psychiatrists. I think of the pop, as they're called, pop psychologists on these TV talk shows. And how they, you know, if everybody just listened to Oprah Winfrey, Everything be right, wouldn't it? But you'd be surprised how she's influenced so many people. And she's just one among many. And people will go and listen to that, and they would never even open the Bible to look at it. In fact, they might run from it because of them. But here's what God declares. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Let's give an example of that in the most fundamental thing, how God saves man from his sins. How God chose to save man just doesn't fit in into the thinking of a lot of folks. And Paul knew that back in the first century. When he wrote to the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 29, he spent time there showing the whole idea of Christ dying, being buried, and raised, ascending to heaven. That was foolishness to these Greek philosophers. They just thought that was ridiculous. And so God said that he chose the weak things to confound people. And it just comes down to this. Well, I can't see that. <laughs> That's what people will say. Or God could save me this way. And I've often thought, just ask somebody, well, yes, he could do this, that, or the other. But have you ever thought to go to his book that's written to guide us and say, what way did he choose? That never seems to cross people's minds. So you got all these different philosophers. And I think I've told you this one time in Singapore when we were going back uh, for some place in a cab back to the hotel. And the fellow driving the cab of Chinese extraction was questioning us on what we were doing. There's about three of us, I think. We told him we were in a lectureship there and teaching the Bible. And he immediately, I guess, thought he would get ecumenical. And I asked him, or somebody did, I believe it was me, ask him what his belief was. And he said, Buddhist. He said, but you know, it really just all of us uh, trying to do what we understand to be right, and it's all acceptable. That was the kind of comment, and he was just happy as a bug in the rug. But when he said that, I said, but what do you think about Jesus when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I haven't heard from him since. He sat right there in the car and continued to drive and that ended the discussion. 
never I don't know what the man thought, but his ecumenism wasn't worth anything. Then there are the teaching of preachers. Oh, my, I've got to go find out what my preacher thinks. And I guess we shouldn't be surprised that religious people trust in their preachers or their priests or whatever they've got that they consider to know more about the Bible than they do. In fact, they expect him to know it when they don't have to know it, so he can tell them. And if you're in Roman Catholicism, then the clergy is the only one that has a right to interpret the Bible to you. You don't know what it means unless they tell you. And they think that these, quote, men of God, unquote, couldn't be wrong and would never lead them astray. However, it was the inspired Apostle Paul who warned Christians how that others would lead them astray because his apostleship was being attacked by members of the church. They weren't outside the church. They were trying to discredit him because of his teaching concerning the Gentiles. And in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 through 15, here's what Paul said. For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed to the ministers of righteousness, then he says it all right here, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, they didn't have denominationalism and Roman Catholicism back in those days, but they had false teachers in the church. And he describes them right here. That's how God views a member of the church who would teach contrary to the doctrine of Christ and warns us about it. And I don't know of any preacher who's faithful to the preaching of the Word and defending it and living it who wants people just to swallow whatever they say. They want people to understand. They want people to ask intelligent questions. They want people to have a personal interest they want people to know the Bible for themselves and to be able to think through things on their own so that they, their faith will not stand in men but in the truth of God's good word. And you do remember that the Lord himself warned about the blind leading the blind, Matthew 15, 12 through 14, and we know the end of them, they all fall in the ditch. Then people will appeal to their the uh, dictates of their conscience. I think some of you, maybe many of you, will remember Walt Disney's 1950s movie on Pinocchio. Anybody remember Jiminy Cricket in Pinocchio? Well, he sang a little song in there. Let your conscience be your guide. People don't understand how God put man together and the place of the conscience in the mind of man. Your conscience is the highest court you have. But all it does is say, feel very good because you've kept the standard you think is the right standard in morals and spiritual matters. Or feel very bad because you violated what you believe to be the right standard in those areas. But the conscience is not the part of the human mind to be educated. It's the intellect and rational part that's educated. And if you're taught false doctrine, your conscience is going to say, fine, feel good. You believe Christians are false teachers? Put them to death. Anybody ever hear Stephen? Anybody ever hear Saul of Tarsus? He said, I've lived in all good conscience before God to this day. But yet a good part of his life was spent persecuting the church, believing Jesus was a false messiah. But his conscience didn't bother him. Because he thought what he was doing was right. So conscience is worthless. If you don't have the right standard of truth filling your intellect. Our conscience, somebody said, and I like this illustration. I hadn't seen it just a while back is like a clock and it works quite well 
when it's set properly. <laughs> and that's exactly how the conscience is. When you're taught the pure, unadulterated, rightly divided Word of God and your will says, I'm going to live by it and apply it to everything I do in this life, then your conscience is going to say, whatever it does, feel good or feel bad based upon that. But think about what Hindus do. You know, you have seen uh, pictures, I'm sure, of Hindus burning their dead, cremation. Did you ever ask why they do that? It's because of the Hindu beliefs. Remember, in the Hindu belief, you die and you're reincarnated. And that goes on and on and on until you reach a certain level and you don't have to be reincarnated anymore. And if you haven't lived too good a life, you could come back as a horse fly. I'm serious. Or some something. But they believe that if you burn that body, you can't come back as a horse fly or anything else. And that's the reason they do it. Now, that tells me that a lot of things that seem so ridiculous to us is a very important matter to somebody else. It was important to Peter that he not eat anything common or unclean as the law prescribed it. But when he received revelation from God pertaining to New Testament authority, so he would know that Gentiles had a right to the same gospel the Jews did, he said at the household of Cornelius, an uncircumcised Gentile, and the first uncircumcised Gentile convert, I perceive that God is no respect of persons. God has showed me that I should not call anything common or unclean when he has cleansed it. Now, now his conscience is going to work differently. And that's the way it works with you and I. That's the reason we should never go against our conscience. They say, well, what do we do? You should educate yourself so your conscience can keep working right. Don't make your conscience spring and sprang. <laughs> Don't do that. Always act in concert with your conscience. Educate your intellect with the truth of God. Now, there are those who want to go by their feelings. I guess there always will be. They don't know much about the business of thinking a thing through and what it even means to say that, to logically consider things. Yet the writer of old said, come, let us reason together. Some people say, come, let us feel together. Well, I'm not opposed to feelings. Not opposed to them at all because God made us with feelings. I just want them to have their proper spot. And the Ethiopian eunuch who didn't know what to do to be saved and found out and did it, went on his way rejoicing. But it was built upon the fact he'd learned the gospel and knew he knew it and that he had complied with its terms of pardon. And he displayed his feelings because he went on his way rejoicing. But that was based upon the fact he had done what God told him to do the way God told him to do it and for the reason God told him to do it. And I've seen people just sit there and read it in the Bible. And it's a very strange feeling comes over me when I see somebody read it and understand it but they base their salvation on this good warm feeling of some sort of happiness they had back down the road when somebody told them that happiness and good feeling is a sign that the Holy Spirit says you're saved well they wouldn't have that and attribute it to the Holy Spirit if they hadn't been taught that that's what you're having happen so it all comes back to teaching teaching of the intellect but people place their confidence in things better felt than told. Now listen to what the Bible says. There is a way which seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 28, 26, and that was Proverbs 14, 12, reads, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. <laughs> Not a fool's round. Have you ever done a study of the Bible and looked up all the kind of fools there are in the Bible? amazing study Jeremiah 10 23 oh Lord I know that the way of man is not in himself it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps well then who's going to direct my steps concerning my salvation and going to heaven Jesus 
the gospel of Christ, the power of God to save us, Romans 1, 16. The scriptures, 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, James 1, 25. None of what we said here should be the ultimate and final standard to consult in our efforts to find the words of life. Not our best friends, not our mother and daddy, not our sons or daughters. It doesn't make any difference. As the Apostle Peter confessed, there's only one. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure we should reach the stage where Peter was. We believe and are sure. No ifs, ands, buts about it. To whom should we go? Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. And that's what Peter confessed in John 6, 68 through 69. Jesus provides food which endures to everlasting life. John 6, 27, 35, and 40. Now that's what got them to this point is when he was trying to teach them concerning him being the bread of life. He is your spiritual sustenance. And those people didn't hang around long enough to find out what he really meant, which shows they really didn't care or they, they would have. He's the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. Jesus has been confirmed to be then the source of eternal life and the only source of eternal life. And we could spend time showing how he worked miracles, John 20, 30, and 31, that we've mentioned often proving that he's the Son of God. The question for us is, how does one go to Jesus? Since he's no longer on the earth, how do we go to Jesus? Well, let's take it through here. We go to Jesus through the apostles of Jesus Christ because they were inspired of the Holy Spirit. They didn't write in and of their own will and learning. Jesus prepared and equipped the apostles to continue and complete his work when he went back to heaven and now is at the right hand of God ruling over his kingdom. You remember in John 16, 7 through 11 that Jesus told the apostles of the work of the Holy Spirit who would take his place with them invisibly and would guide them into all truth. John 16, 12 and 13. So to receive the apostles is to receive Jesus. John 13 and uh, verse number 20. So the apostles are the authoritative spokesmen for Christ. They are, as I've said many, many times, the ambassadors of the court of heaven to earth. You want to know what Jesus, the king, head of his government, says? Go to his ambassador. That needs to be understood. You go out here in the religious world, they don't understand that. They think that uh, every member of whatever they think the church is, is an ambassador. No, only Twelve apostles, you might say that way. The apostles of Christ. They received all things, according to Peter, that pertained to life and godliness. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. And they've written it down so that we can understand that. And they didn't shun to proclaim the whole counsel of God. So Paul wrote, Acts 20, 20 through 21, or said, and Luke wrote it in verse 27 too. But now another question, of course, arises. How do we go to the apostles? They're no longer on the earth either. We have to turn right back to where it always comes to, the New Testament of Jesus Christ, the repository of the Word of God. They wrote by inspiration of the Spirit that we might benefit from their understanding. We were studying Ephesians this morning and noticed that Paul said, Plainly, when you read my words, you'll understand what I know in the mystery of Christ. So, we must view their words as the commandments of God, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. So, therefore, we're told to hold fast to what they taught. 2 Thessalonians 2, 15. Chapter 3, 14. That's why Jude said, Contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And the first church of Christ on earth set that example for us, and it hasn't changed. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2.42. So, the words pertaining to eternal life are preserved in the apostles' inspired writings. You say, well, what about James or Luke? They weren't apostles of Christ. 
No, but they had the apostolic office conveyed to them by the laying on of the apostles' hands. In fact, even the apostles, though they had all gifts and could convey those gifts to others during the apostolic age, they still wrote by the prophetic office, which they received by the baptismal measure of the Spirit. They alone can lead us to Jesus who alone has the words of eternal life. So to whom shall we go? It must be Jesus. That is the answer. He's the Christ. He's the Son of the living God. He alone has the words of eternal life. Not Buddha. Not the Vedas of the Hindus. Not the Quran. Not Joseph Smith and Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price, which they get most of their doctrine from those books. None of those. It's Jesus Christ and his last will and testament. It is the words of apostles who are eyewitnesses of his majesty and inspired by the Holy Spirit to reveal all that we need to experience life and godliness and to take us to glory. It's very simple, but yet the simplicity of it has been overlooked by countless people because they go everywhere but to the source. And that's what's happening right now to this very hour. And if the world lasts 10,000 years in the future, they'll do it right up to the time. Let's not be a part of it. Let's be different in the sense that we know where to go and we're directing other people where to go to learn the words pertaining to eternal life. Now, they may not hear it, but that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to know it, to teach it, to live it, to contend for it, to expose error, and point men back to Christ. And remember what we said in the beginning. Few there be that find it. So don't let that get you down. Rejoice. Don't be proud in it, but rejoice you found it. Thank God for it. Few do. Be humble and meek as you're happy about it and thankful for it. And then realize the responsibility laid upon your shoulders to do your best to sow the seed of the kingdom to as many people as you can. If you're not a child of God, we urge you to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. And again, as a child of God, if you sin, humble yourself and repent. Pray God for forgiveness, having confessed those sins. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.